I think that um, it's interesting. There are a lot of smart people uh, who've argued that we're actually living in an era of innovation stagnation. Uh, a friend of mine humorously was pointing out that whereas during the second industrial revolution you had trains and you had all this, you know, kind of, you know, really dramatic stuff, the telegraph, things that changed the world. Now, okay, we had telephones, then we had computers, then we plugged telephones together with computers, and then it was easier to buy airline tickets and stuff like that, and that was awesome. But, I mean, it's not obvious how that has, you know, uh, really changed the texture of our lives. Whereas, you know, when you're looking at nanotechnology, this idea of, you know, kind of manufacturing materials at the molecular level, well, then we could do pretty much anything. I mean, then, you know, you could build, you know, enormous numbers of nuclear power plants at radically low cost, which would mean that all electrical power would essentially be free, uh, which means that, you know, I could surround myself with neon all the time and, you know, who knows what kind of effects that would have on my productivity. Uh, or, you know, a world in which we have machines that are comparable to humans in intelligence uh, and could also be self-improving so that they could, again, uh, lead all humans to live in this tremendous life of luxury um, in which, you know, you could read machine-produced novels or organic novels written by actual people. And that would be the job, you know, done by half of the population because, again, you know, there's no other economically needful activity. Um, I think that this would be a time of tremendous cultural chaos but it would also be pretty exciting and neat to see uh, because, you know, you would see human ingenuity manifest itself in all kinds of totally unpredictable, unfamiliar ways. Um, so, yeah, I think that actually the frustrating thing is that we're always on the cusp of all of this stuff, right? I mean, there are all these technologies that are like, oh, 10 years away. Pebble bed nuclear reactors are 10 years away. Um, you know, you have nano pants now, so I could spill orange juice on my pants and they won't stain. That's pretty cool. But, you know, that's not, you know, building nuclear power plants for five dollars. Um, but I actually am kind of optimistic about this stuff, if only because my basic view is that if we don't have these radical technological advances, we'll all be doomed uh, in the next, you know, 50, 60 years. And given that I don't think we're going to be doomed, I kind of think that there's going to be some deus ex machina kind of thing that will rescue us all. Um, and also when you look at the kind of climate change landscape, I mean, you know, people talk about cap and trade and it's like, this is absurd. I mean, we're way past 350 parts per million. Uh, you need some kind of radical technological breakthrough to solve this problem. Um, and again, unless Earth turns to a soupy mass in which we're all dead and, you know, kind of a volcano kind of swallows us all in molten lava, we need it. So it's not really a negotiable thing. I think that you're already seeing lots of new designs for reactors, modular designs, et cetera, that seem very attractive, seem radically safer than previous generations uh, of nuclear power plants. And when you're looking at modular designs, they solve a lot of different problems. Uh, they help solve a problem of cost. Uh, they also kind of might spur, you know, kind of manufacturing employment. Uh, they might spur, you know, kind of um, a new export market for the United States. Um, but, you know, more broadly, I mean, it's all embedded in this wider regulatory context. So when you're looking at the NRC, they probably don't have enough staff to evaluate all of the kind of new designs that are coming out um, to feel kind of really secure about that. And so I think that that's one that's really kind of holding us back, whereas the Chinese, the South Africans, a variety of other places. In India, there's a huge amount of work on thorium-based nuclear power and creating an export industry around that. So I think that there are a lot of promising developments. It's not obvious to me that the United States is going to be the pioneer in this regard. Again, because like a lot of first world countries, we have this kind of tough regulatory process that will slow it down. But I do think that the kind of capital expenditures required to create nuclear power plants are going to decline. And I think that if we move in this modular direction, we see nuclear power solve kind of smaller scale problems, uh, then I think it's going to, again, be a flank attack on this big problem. So rather have this kind of, rather than have the centralized solution of let's mimic France, let's allow people to kind of use a, a tiny nuclear power plant to operate um, you know, a, a neighborhood or to operate, you know, some kind of like large scale manufacturing facility. The other thing, and this relates to a lot of the talk about the smart grid, the idea of a national uh, electrical grid. This is a very attractive idea to a lot of people. But to me, you know, modular nuclear power feeds in with district heating and a variety of other ideas for making our energy system more resilient rather than less resilient. So I wonder, rather than creating a kind of super centralized system, you know, perhaps it makes more sense for us to actually distribute the way that we distribute power, uh, uh, rather than uh, distribute power creation um, across the country in a way that's going to make us less vulnerable to kind of supply disruptions.